now I'm recording. Yeah, so a quadratic function is a function of the form f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, b, and c are real numbers and the leading coefficient a doesn't equal zero. The domain of a quadratic function, of any quadratic function, is the set of all real numbers. And now for an inequality, is going to be in the form of ax squared plus bx plus c, either greater than zero, less than zero, less than or equal to zero, or greater than or equal to zero. And the way we'll answer quadratic inequality is based on the actual graph. Okay. So characteristics of a quadratic function, its graph. So if a quadratic function's leading coefficient is positive, which you see right here. So if the leading coefficient is positive, then your parabola will open up. So the graph of a quadratic function is called a parabola. It will open up, and there are some key points on this parabola. You have a vertex, which is the main point of the parabola, and then you'll have a y-intercept. And then based on the equation of your quadratic function, you will either have two x-intercepts, one x-intercept, or no x-intercepts. So it all depends on the equation we're given. So a parabola can have two x-intercepts, one x-intercept, or no x-intercepts. And then the last part is you have an axis of symmetry, which means that that is the line that cuts straight through the middle of the parabola, goes straight through the vertex, and you can reflect points across it. It's called the axis of symmetry. So if I have a point here, I can reflect it across the axis of symmetry and have a point there, equal distance from that line. Okay, so those are the characteristics of a parabola who opens up, means your leading coefficient of A is positive. And then if your parabola opens down, this means your leading coefficient is negative. Okay, so and if your parabola opens down, you still have the main features on your parabola. Vertex, y-intercept, possibly two x-intercepts, possibly one x-intercept, or possibly no x-intercepts. And again, the axis of symmetry. So those are the key features of a parabola. And remember, a parabola is the graph of a quadratic function. All right. And now today, in order to graph these parabolas, we're going to be taking the standard form. So we will be given the standard form. And by using the completing the square method, we will put it into vertex form. And once you put the standard form into vertex form, then you're going to be able to see the vertex HK given here, H and K. And then after we have the vertex, we can then find the line of symmetry, which is given as x equals h. So this is easy point right here. If you have the h value for your vertex, that is the same value that is for your line of symmetry. So free money right there, right? OK. And over here, these are the formulas to find the vertex. I'll show you how to use those as well. So we don't always have to complete the square. But I'll show you those after we get through the completing the square process. OK. And just some basics about y-intercepts, some stuff we know already. To find a y-intercept, you let x equals 0, and you solve for y. This is stuff we know already. To find your x-intercepts, well, if we're given a quadratic function, we have three options. We can factor it. We can use a quadratic formula, uh, and we can graph it. So, But mainly, the two options are factoring or quadratic formula to help us solve for the x-intercepts. So to find an x-intercept, we let y equal 0, and we solve for x. And now, if you want to save some time, but I think, I don't know, I think it's an extra step, but it works if you want to determine right from the beginning how many intercepts you have. So this is something called the discriminant. And the discriminant will tell you 
how many intercepts your function has. All you have to do is plug in the values of B, A, and C to this formula. If your values are greater than zero, then you'll have two X intercepts. If your values are equal to zero, you'll have one X intercept. And if your values are less than zero, then you'll have no X intercepts. So it's helpful, but then it's kind of to me, to me, it's like, okay, well, if it tells you you have, you have two X intercepts, guess what? You still have to go find those X intercepts. So, and it's the same for the two X intercepts and the one X intercept. The only part where I see it's helpful and not an extra step is you have no X intercepts. But no matter what, you're, you're plugging in and you're seeing how many intercepts you have, which I think is an extra step, but it isn't actually, it's a cool formula because it tells you how many intercepts you have. But we can find that out just by solving for them. Why not? Okay. Max or min. So let's go back and look at these graphs. And you guys remember, remember maximums and minimums. If you have a minimum, well, then you have a low point on the graph. So if your parabola opens up, this means that the vertex is also the minimum. It is the lowest point on the graph. And then if your vertex opens, if your parabola opens down, this means that your vertex is a max. Okay, so that's for max and mins. And what's the last piece for these characteristics? Range. Okay, I'll go back and show this then. All right. So the range for a parabola that opens up, since your parabola opens up, the range will start at the Y value of your vertex, or we can even say the K value of our vertex and head towards infinity. So we would start at this Y value and we see that these tails head towards infinity. So if your parabola opens up, your range starts at the Y value of the vertex and goes to infinity. I'll say or K to infinity. And then if your parabola opens down, then your range will start at where these tails are headed. Those tails are headed towards negative infinity. And as we come up, we'll stop at the Y value of the vertex. And again, or negative infinity to K. And the reason I'm putting K is because our vertex, the main point of the parabola is noted as HK, which is also the Y value. Okay, cool. So those are the characteristics of the quadratic functions and the parabolas. So we're gonna start using them on the next page. What's up, Carl? Everything good? <clears throat> oh yeah, how about you? Surviving over here, we're good. All right. So let's get started. All right, so number one. Given f of x equals x squared minus 8x plus 12, we have a lot of stuff to find. Find the vertex form, find the vertex, find the axis of symmetry, find the x and y intercepts, graph it, find concavity, max or mins, domain, range, intervals of increase or decrease, and find out where we are greater than zero and less than or equal to zero. Bah. That's a lot going on. So. First thing we're going to do is go for the vertex form. So we'll call this A. So to get to the vertex form, we're going to start with our function. 
in standard form. And we are going to complete the square to put it into vertex form. So remember to complete the square, we have to be in a certain form. And that form is that the leading coefficient needs to be one. So this is in the perfect form to complete the square. And we only worry about the two terms, the x squared and the x or the eight x. So when we complete the square on this, we're gonna take half of negative eight and square it. This will give me negative four squared, which will give me 16. And then after we complete the square, we will add and subtract that number to both, well, on the same line. So f of x equals x squared minus 8x plus 16 minus 16 plus 12. And then every time after you complete the square, you end up with a trinomial a perfect square trinomial that is factorable. So we will factor this. And this means we will end up with f of x equals x minus 4 times x minus 4. And then the negative 16 plus 12 will give me negative 4. And clean it up we get f of x equals x minus four squared minus four. And this is called the vertex form. <clears throat> okay, any questions on that? No, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. All right. So now we have the vertex form. This means we can go ahead and find the vertex. So the next two answers are going to be really easy because they're built off of this vertex form. So for B, we'll find the vertex. And for my vertex, you're going to state the x value and the y value or the h and k value. So remember that with our x's, we have to think opposite because these are still transformations. This x minus four means we have a shift to the right. So for my h value, it's not gonna be negative four, it's going to be positive four. And my k value is still negative four. So there's our vertex. And then my axis of symmetry, like I said, easy money here. If you have the H value for your vertex, then you have the value for your axis of symmetry. So X is gonna equal four. They go hand in hand. Okay. So we have vertex form, vertex, axis of symmetry, and the next thing are the x and y intercepts. Okay. So let's go for the x intercepts first. Oh, that should have been <laughs> C, right? I'll say x intercepts. And we let f of x equal 0. So since we put this in vertex form, let's go ahead and use that form to find the x-intercepts. So all we're going to do is take this vertex form and set it equal to 0. And now all we have to do is solve for x. Add that four over. 
And then next, we'll square root both sides. And you'll get x minus 4 is equal to plus or minus 2. Do not forget that plus or minus. And then you'll add that 4 over. And my two answers are going to be 4 plus 2 and 4 minus 2. So we're going to get x equals 6 and x equals 2. These are my x-intercepts that I can plot at 6, 0 and 2, 0. Now, do take note that we could have used the standard form of the function. I'm just going to write this down real fast, and then I'll erase it. If we use the standard form of the function, well, all we have to do is factor this. Of course, if it's factorable. And it just so happens that the two factors of 12 that can make negative 8 are x minus 6 and x minus 2 which, there we go. So just know that you can use the original function, the standard form, to also get your x-intercepts. But it has to be factorable. If it's not factorable, then I would use the vertex form as I, as I have shown here. So just know that you can do that. OK. And now, for the y-intercepts, it's actually going to be a lot easier to use the standard form. If you use the standard form for the y-intercepts, you're going to get the y-intercept right away. So let me do this. For the y-intercept, you let x equal 0. And this means you'll do f of 0. And if I go and look at the standard form, if I plug in 0, this becomes 0, that becomes 0, and what are we left with? Spicy number 12. There you go. So I'll just put it here. 0 squared, uh, what is it, minus 8 times 0 plus 12, and f of 0 equals 12. And there's my y-intercept at 0, 12. Now well, that's a lot faster than using the actual vertex form. OK, so we have vertex form. We have the vertex. We have the axis of symmetry. We have the intercepts. We can now move on to graphing this thing. So I'm going to look at all my points and make my x and y axis, uh, make their intervals appropriate. So my vertex is 4, negative 4. I have 6 and 2 as my x-intercepts, but then my y-intercept is 12. So I'm just going to make the y values just go up by 2s. The x-axis can stay the same. So 0, 12, and negative 4. OK. So I'm just going to change these. So that's still 0. And then 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. And then 2 and negative 4. Everything else on the x-axis will stay the same. And we're now ready to plot. So I'll put the vertex down at 4, negative 4. So 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 4. There's my vertex. And then I'll plot my x and y intercepts. So I have x intercepts at 6 and 2. So that's 4, 5, 6, and then 2. There's my x intercepts. And then my y intercept is at 12. So up there. And all you need is three points to graph your parabola. You need the vertex being your main point 
and then either your X intercepts or Y intercepts to graph the rest of it. But three points is all you need. So now all we have to do is connect the points. And there's the graph of our parabola. <clears throat> that is the graph of X squared minus eight X plus 12 which means we can answer the rest of the questions now. Okay, any questions so far? No. <clears throat> okay, so next is something called concavity, right? So I'll put a little side note over here. So if you're ever concave up, you would look something like this. And if you're ever concave down, you would look something like that. And the reason I put breaks in it is because you can have a graph that is both concave up and concave down. But you can also have a graph that is fully concave up and a graph that is fully concave down. So since this graph opens up, this graph is fully concave up. So we'll just put that here. So this is concave up. And next is max or minimum. Well, since this opens up, what do we have? Do we have a max or a min? Minimum. Minimum. So we'll just say there's a minimum. I'll just change the color again. There we go. Minimum at the vertex. I forget what my math lab wants. It either just wants the Y value of your vertex or maybe it wants the whole vertex. But I'll just say there's a minimum at negative four. Okay, <clears throat> or k equals negative four. And then the domain in range, we'll remember from the first page that since this is a quadratic function, the domain of all quadratic functions is all real numbers, negative infinity to infinity. That's gonna be the domain for all your quadratic functions that we're dealing with. And then it wants range, and since this parabola opens up, what y value do we start at for the range? Negative four. Negative four, good. And we head towards infinity. Okay, we're getting through it. We have max or min, domain and range. Now we want intervals of increase and decrease. Oh boy, so much stuff. And reading the graph from left to right, we'll start with decrease and increase. So where is this graph decreasing on? What X intervals? Maybe it might help to put the actual values here. This is two, that's four, and that's six. Because remember, Intervals of increase and decrease only state X values. So where does it look like this graph is decreasing at? Two and six? Decreasing. Just so, kidding. So is this graph falling this way? When you read it left to right? Yes. Yes. So it would be decreasing at anything less than four. Good. So negative infinity to four. Everybody good with that? Yes. What we're saying is that from here to here, we are decreasing. Which means where would you be increasing at? From four to infinity. That's it. Oh, it's the opposite. Yeah, that's it. See? Because now you're increasing. 
or to infinity. Okay. And all of that was for 4.3. <laughs> now, the inequalities, we're going to answer for 4.5. So see, I was lucky to be able to jumble these up. So we'll just say 4.5, and we're going to use these inequalities that it wanted to answer. It wants to know, on what intervals are you greater than 0? And on what intervals are we less than or equal to 0? And again, we only state x values. So what this is actually asking us is the first one wants to know, where are we above the x-axis? The next one's asking us, where are we below and on the x-axis? And remember, we only state x intervals. So let's go ahead and answer the first one. Looking at the graph, where are we above the x-axis? On what x intervals? At 2, 0. So when we're less than 2, 0, but more than 6, 0. So how would you put that in interval notation? Oh, sorry. Negative infinity to 2 union 2, 6. Well, we're only we're answering them separately. So that 2, 6 will be for the next one. Oh, sorry. Um, 6 to infinity. There you go. So what we're saying is that from negative infinity to 2, we are above the x-axis. Does it look like that? And then from 6 to infinity, we are also above. And now to answer the second question, it says, where are you below and on the x-axis? And you already had that answer. What was it? 2, 6. 2, 6. And this time they are included. And that's all 4.5 is about, is <laughs> just answering those questions. So it's going to make you graph them and then answer those simple questions. So any questions on this problem? So pretty much for this, we're just taking out that union in between and we're just identifying what's above and what's below. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So that's all these inequalities ask. They either ask, where are you above the x-axis? Where are you above and on the x-axis? Or where are you below or below and on the x-axis? So that's how we answer these inequalities. OK. And before moving on from this one, I'm going to show you how to use the shortcut method to find the vertex, which will be really helpful in 4.5. So let's just start with our quadratic function again. And remember that this is in the form of ax squared plus bx plus c. So in order to find the vertex the short way, we would say that h is equal to negative b over 2a. Well, what's my b value from the problem above? A. Negative 8, right? Or negative 8, my bad. Good. And what's my a value? 1. 1. That gives you 8 over 2, which gives me 4 which matches up right there. And then to find the k value, you're going to take this 4 and plug it into the function. Because if we plug in an x, it's going to give us a y. 
So we're going to say f of 4, and you'll get 4 squared minus 8 times 4 plus 12. And I'll get 16 minus 32 plus 12, which gives me negative 16 plus 12, which gives me negative 4. And there it is, y'all. There's the vertex based on the short way to do it. Got it. 4, negative 4. No completing the square needed, right? Mm. So that's just another, day, another, yeah, another way to check your work. I think my math lab is going to want vertex form, though, for 4.3. So that's why I show that. And again, I was, I was gonna more ask, methods. Where does that not work? <laughs> since you didn't show it to us first. <laughs> True. Vertex form works all the time. It just can be a little messy, like the next problem we're going to get into. But I want to show you this shortcut because it's going to be very helpful in 4.5. Because in 4.5 homework, you don't have to find the vertex form. It's just, honestly, I think all 4.5 is going to say is, it's going to give you the quadratic inequality, and it's going to say, just give me these answers. That's it. You have right. to know how to get there, right? Okay. So for the next one, yes, I'm going to torture you again with vertex form. <laughs> but is everybody good with this one? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, for now, right? Amari. Okay. Yeah, this is what we're going over. I'll post the notes in here again, just for anybody who doesn't have them. Okay, let's keep going then. Yeah, that shortcut method's nice, right? <laughs> okay, here we go again. So given negative four x squared minus six x plus two, go through all of that again. I think that last problem took like 30 minutes. <laughs> Imagine our homework. Right? Well, I mean, if I wasn't teaching you to you, I'd be doing these in like two minutes, but that's just me, okay? <laughs> You're smart. Maybe I've just done it too many times. And again, the reason I'm showing you vertex form is because knowing how to complete the square is definitely essential. It's also essential to your survival in your next following math classes. Okay, so if we're gonna complete the square on this, it needs to be in that proper form, which it is not. So the leading coefficient has to be one, but our leading coefficient here is negative four. So this means we have to take out the negative four before moving on. So I'll say negative four. I'll factor it out just from those two terms. And I'll be left with x squared plus six over four x plus two. So just be careful with that. I took a four out and I took a four out from six. So remember factoring is essentially dividing from those terms. And since it was negative from negative, it became positive. Okay. And then before continuing more, oops, I'm gonna reduce that fraction to make our work less crazy. And now we are ready to complete the square because the quadratic inside is now in the perfect form. So I'll say three halves divided by two squared. Let me zoom in. I'll rewrite that. And what's gonna happen here is that you have to put this two over one and multiply by the reciprocal. 
which will then give me 3 fourths squared, which will then give me 9 over 16. Ugly, ugly, ugly. And now we're ready to put it back in. And negative 4 times x squared plus 3 halves x plus 9 over 16 minus 9 over 16 plus 2. And now we can factor this guy. Put a bracket to be neat. And this is going to factor to x plus 3 fourths times x plus three-fourths. So like Carl said last time, is that if you're wondering how to factor these, well, the trick is whatever number you square in the completing the square process is the number that goes inside your factors, your parentheses for your factors. So that's a nice little trick, especially when handling something this nasty. minus 9 over 16, close bracket, plus 2. And then another rewrite, negative 4, and this becomes x plus 3 4 squared, minus 9 over 16, plus 2. And now we're just going to distribute this to both terms. And we'll almost be there in vertex form. Just awful, right? Negative 4 times x plus 3 4 squared. And negative 4 times negative 9 over 16 should give me a positive 9 fourths plus 2. And now I just got to combine those two, and we have our vertex form. Painfully, but rewarding. And 2 times 4 is 8. 8 plus 9, I get 17 over 4. How'd you guys like that one? Not at all. Fractions. <laughs> Fractions are life. Okay. This is on our test, just out of curiosity. <laughs> this stuff that we're learning right now, yes, this is why I'm lecturing it because today was supposed to be test day. Okay. Just wondering. Okay. Yeah. I don't think I'd put one this complicated on there. Okay. That's what I was if thinking. I did, I'm sorry, but you can reference your notes. <laughs> Smart. Thanks. All right. Fractions are your friends. Fractions are friends. I told you I'm gonna be famous one day. I'm gonna make the first fraction cereal. But nobody will buy it because nobody likes fractions. No one <laughs> likes math. <laughs> All right. So there is vertex form. Painfully got there, but hey, it's good practice. Which means now you can find the vertex. which is going to be negative 3 fourths and 17 fourths. And we might as well convert this to decimal because we have to know how to graph this. So we know that's negative 0.75 and 17 over 4. What is that? 4.25? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I'm good. Woo! <laughs> Okay. And then, of course, if you know the h value for your vertex, 
you know the value for your axis of symmetry. Negative three-fourths. Money, money right there. Okay, next is intercepts. Ooh, okay. So, D. We'll look at x-intercepts, and we let f of x equal zero. And for this one, if we take our vertex form, and set it equal to zero. Oh, more nastiness, right? So now we have to solve for these x-intercepts. Move that 17 fourths over. Divide by negative four, or I'm just going to say multiply by the reciprocal negative one fourth. That's going to handle that a lot better. And you'll get x plus 3 fourths squared equal to positive 17 over 16. Yuck. Then square root both sides. And you'll get x plus 3 fourths equal to plus or minus square root 17 over 4. OK. And then move the 3 fourths over. And you get this nastiness right here, which means I'm going to use a calculator to see what I have for my actual x-intercepts. So Desmos away. I'll leave that so you guys can look at that. And I'm just going to type those in. Negative 3 fourths plus square root 17 over 4. So one of these is going to be at 0 0.28. And then the other is going to be at negative 1.78. Yeehaw. All right, that wasn't too bad. <laughs> which means we're at 0.28 and zero and negative 1.78 and zero. There's my x-intercepts. Okay, and like I said, y-intercept is always easiest. Just look back at the original form, the standard form. And if we plug in zero, that's zero, that's zero. And what do we get for our y-intercept? The magic number two. Yay. That's so much easier, right? Okay, let you guys catch up if you need to. Any questions so far? Nope, I gave up on this one a long time ago. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So all we have left is uh, graphing it. Concavity, max, min, domain, range, increase, decrease, blah, 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 blah. Let's do it. <laughs> so let's see. My Y values, I'm at 2 and 4.25. So I can just leave that alone. My X axis, I'm at negative 0.75 and negative 0.28 and negative 1.78. So what if I just went by halves and just be somewhat of a sketch with it? Let's see. Yeah, we can go by that. So Y values will stay the same. And let me see if this will work. Zero. And then about 0 0.5, 1, 1.5 and 2. And then over here, 0 0.5, 1. And then negative 1.5 and then negative 2. There we go. Probably going to have to move that, right? Let me see. You took a negative two with you. Did I? Oh, well. All right. All good. Let's see. My Y values will stay the same. OK. Cool. So let's go ahead and plot our vertex, negative 0.75 and 4.25. Like I said, it doesn't have to be perfect. So negative 0.75 and 4.25. So here's 0 0.75, 1, 2, 3, 4. I'll put my vertex right there. And then my x-intercepts are at... 0.28 and negative 1.78. 0.28, so I'm going to put that just right there. And negative 1.78, I'll just put right there. Why not? That's a little off. It's fine. And I'll just mark these. And my y-intercept was just at two, <laughs> right there. Look at that, beautiful. Okay. And now just connect. And answer the last questions. All right. This is going to be concave what? Concave down. Concave down. Max or min? Max. Max. And then we know what the domain is for all of these. All real numbers, but what's my range going to be? Negative, negative infinity to 17 over 4. Good. And then intervals of increase and decrease. So from left to right, I'll write this down. Where are we increasing at? Negative infinity to 17 and a quarter. Uh, X values only, remember? Sorry, 17, oh, X values only. Uh, 
negative, negative three. Point seven there you five. Go. There you go. And then decreasing from where? Negative three quarters to infinity. There you go. E to the lopsided infinity. He's not lopsided. He just needs a little help. Yeah. All right. So increase, decrease. And now we want to answer those final questions. So again, I'll just do this here. We'll say 4.5. Where's the function greater than or equal to zero? And where is the function less than zero? So greater than or equal to zero means above and on the x-axis. So what intervals would that be? Negative 1.78 and 0.28. That's it. And then the last one says, where are we just below the x-axis? Negative infinity to negative 1.78. There you go. Point two eight to infinity. That's it. Woof. I could probably put that down there. Move, 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 move. There we go. And that's graphing quadratics, y'all. And answering quadratic inequalities. Any questions on that one? My head hurts, make it stop. <laughs> <laughs> Just that one's pretty brutal, right? All right. Last two and we're done. Okay, so hopefully there'll be some time left for some questions. Maybe I'll just do one of these. So I'll do number three. <laughs> nice, running to get Advil. All right, the graph of the function f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c has its vertex at one negative five and has a y-intercept at negative three. Find a, b, and c. Ooh la la. So they're giving us a vertex and a y-intercept. So what would the what would be the best form to use? Vertex form? Yeah, vertex form. And from your first page, remember that vertex form is a times x minus h squared plus k which means if they're giving us a vertex at one negative five, well, what can I plug in for H? One. One, and what can I plug in for K? Negative five. There you go. Look at that. And then it says we have a y-intercept at negative three. So they're giving us a y-intercept at negative 3. So if we have y-intercept at negative 3, what's the value of x? How do you find a y-intercept? It's going to be 0. Right. Y-intercept is 0, negative 3. So we can use that information and plug 0 in for x to solve for what letter do we not know? 
B. Well, we don't know B or C yet, but what's the obvious or letter A. we don't know yet? A, right? So remember that when X is zero, Y is negative three. So F of zero becomes negative three. And we get A times negative one squared minus five. which means that you'll get negative three equals a minus five. Add the five over, and what's a going to equal? It'll equal two. Two. A, so we have a, yee which means come back to vertex form and rewrite it. f of x equals two times x minus 1 squared minus 5. And now in order to find a, b, and c, I mean, we know a already, but in order to find the, all the rest of them, you just have to FOIL it out. That's it. 2 times x squared minus 2x plus 1 minus 5. 2x squared minus 4x plus 2 minus 5. Actually, we knew c all along, right? Right, Carl? <laughs> yeah yeah 2x squared minus 4x plus no not plus minus 3 and now y'all what are the values of a b and c two squared minus 4x minus 3 well, just the coefficients, but two, oh, two negative X four, negative three. three. There we go. And that's what we're looking for. Not bad. All right, that didn't take any time at all. So we can do the next one, which is going to be exactly the same as this one. <laughs> So again, they're giving us a vertex. So it's going to be smart, again, to use the vertex form. Let me come down here. And now, what am I plugging in for my h value? Negative two. Negative two. And what am I plugging in for K? Six. Six. And now F of X equals A times X plus two squared plus six. And we need to solve for A. So what number can we plug in for X that they're giving us? We can plug in negative four because That's that it. should give us a y of negative two. Mm -hmm. F of negative four equals a times negative four plus two squared plus six. And what we're saying is that when x is negative four, y becomes negative two. And then you get a times, what's that, negative two squared plus six. And then that'll give me 4a plus 6. Move the 6 over. You get negative 8. Divide, divide by 4, and a is going to be what? Negative 2. Negative 2 equals a. Good. Now, last piece is just rewrite this and FOIL it up. Negative 2 times x squared plus 4x plus 4 plus 6. 
negative 2x squared minus 8x minus 8 plus 6. All right, negative, 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 and negative 2x squared minus 8x minus 2. There you go, guys. That's it. That is 4.3 and 4.5 in a nutshell, which means we have 40 minutes for you to ask any questions over homework and the test review. If you don't have questions, then you can definitely go ahead and get started on your exam, which doesn't close till Friday. So you can take it now, you can take it tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, but I would prefer you take it by Thursday so I can grade everything by Friday. I have a question. Can we open and close it, if that makes sense? Or like once we open it, it's open and that's it. I 